Rodney, and thank you for that kind welcome and for coming. Um, there is a cautionary tale here in, in this story. As you'll notice, there's sort of false advertising involved. Um, I am a historian, and I am going to look at Valentine's Day, but I probably am not going to do what the advertisement said I was going to do. And the reason for that is, when Rodney asked me to join this august group of folks who were talking as part of his Turning the Wheel project, I, of course, said yes. But that was like a year ago. And I thought, well, Valentine's Day, I'll talk about Valentine's. That's kind of obvious. And then work intervened, and work intervened, and it got closer. And then President Nellis mentioned it in the Friday letter. And I thought, oh, dear, I probably need to have some kind of talk. And then the press people called, and they said, what are you going to, you know, we want to interview you about this lecture. And I go, well, I don't have a lecture yet. And they go, no, seriously. And I go, I'm about as serious as I can be. I don't have a lecture yet. And the, the pressure continued to mount, and I began to grapple with what could the topics be. And looking at what Rodney Brilliant, people, people have said, the abstract was so interesting. Well, Professor Fry wrote the abstract for me <laughs> because I was kind of dean. And people have been saying, oh, this will be so exciting. And I thought, well, you know, I could do the standard thing. Each and every adult person in the United States will spend $126.03 on average for Valentine's items, $17.6 billion. And I'm thinking, what could we do in higher education? Or for poor children, or for the environment, or for any number of things with $17.6 billion. And I thought, I don't want to go there. <laughs> so then I did what the traditional historian does. Valentine's is a saint. And of course, there's this whole area of study about saints. And in fact, there were three St. Valentines. Which one to pick? Who knows? And scholars have engaged in an endless debate about which one is the St. Valentine's we're talking about. My favorite, and they were all martyrs, which I'm not sure what that, but I'm sure that has some meaningful connection to all of this. So my favorite St. Valentine's was, was um, incarcerated for attempting to convert the Roman Emperor Claudius II to Christianity. And while he was in prison, he, the daughter of the jailer was blind. And this saint cured her blindness, which is a miracle, which is one of the things you have to do to be a saint. And then he fell in love with the daughter and sent her a message from jail that said, from your Valentine. Hence the beginning, at least in theory, of this. I kind of like that. But then I went, now what do I do? And I'm not exactly <laughs> sure. So then I relied upon scholars. That's what historians do. They rely on the work of others. And Henry Angser Kelly is a very prominent medieval historian. In fact, he's the director of the UCLA Center for Medieval and Renaissance <coughs> Studies. And he says this all goes back to Geoffrey Chaucer. I think medievalists always say everything goes back to <laughs> Geoffrey Chaucer. But be that as it may, Chaucer was employed in the court of Richard II. And Richard II got engaged to Anne of Bohemia. And it was kind of a big deal because he beat out a French prince and a German nobleman for her hand. And he said, you know, I need a poem. That's what Chaucer's job was. And Chaucer's <coughs> thinking about when he was in Italy. And, they talked about the St. Valentine's, and that saint's day was May 3rd. So he writes some poetry. That's kind of why we got birds and flowers for Valentine's Day, which in most of the Western Hemisphere in February, not so much. But in May, yes. So Chaucer writes this poem. It's called The Parliament of Fowls, F-O-W-L-S. It's it's a poem about the raiding, mating rituals of birds, and then makes parallels between those mating rituals and those of human beings. And I'm thinking, OK, I'm a scholar. You can't go wrong with Chaucer. This will be a good thing for me. And at the next day, I get an email from our daughter, Rebecca, 
who's in Kathmandu. And she's been on a trek on top of an elephant out in the jungle in some godforsaken place where her mother wishes she would come home. <laughs> and the big topic of conversation was that Siberian lovebirds were spotted all over there and that apparently they come from Siberia to Kathmandu in February and mate. So I'm thinking, okay. I got birds, I have a connection to the College of Natural Resources, <laughs> I got Chaucer, and then I thought, can I really explicate a Chaucer poem in front of an audience like this, especially members I see of the Department of English? I thought that was much too daunting a task, and so no more Chaucer. So what else can I do that was more contemporary in nature? And so. I have visual aids. I got my conversation hearts out. And if you open these, you, oh dear, you may notice that now there are hearts that say, text me and friend me. <laughs> Who knew? And so perhaps I can make a connection to new media and the School of Journalism and Mass Media and, are you ready, Rodney? And how ubiquitous new media is. <laughs> And then I wasn't sure what to do with that. And then I looked at some of the other things like say yes and kiss me and some other things that are even too salacious to mention that appear on these hearts that we give to children. And I thought, no, 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 not for an afternoon speech. So that didn't work. So then I thought, perhaps Valentine's. And on your seats, you all may have seen a Captain America Valentine. And as some of you know, I've recently published an article about Captain America and other heroes and how one uses them in the history classroom. So I thought, OK, I got Valentine's. I got Captain America. This is good. And then, thanks to great Hallmark, I looked at this box which includes not just the Valentines that you received, but a poster of Captain America and stickers and a special teacher Valentine <laughs> that is better than the Valentines that you received. <laughs> and Hallmark greatly, uh, and I greatly appreciate this, includes 32 Valentines in this box because Hallmark knows that 32 is probably the most students one would want to have in your elementary classroom. Except if you're Idaho Superintendent of Schools, Tom Luna, you think there should be more than that in the class <laughs> because that would save money. And that's a tie to education, but it was kind of political. And I thought, hmm, don't want to go there. So no Valentine's. So then, what will I do? So I was in Boise last week. I feel like I'm in Boise all the time. And Judy Collins did a highly acclaimed concert in, at the Egyptian theater there, and you all are too young. Judy Collins is one of the icons of the 60s and 70s. She's the person that Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young are talking about in Sweet Judy Blue Eyes. She's really important, trust me. So, her best known song is called Both Sides. And the most quoted line from it is, I've looked at love from both sides now, from up and down, but still somehow. It's love's illusion, I recall. I really don't know love at all. <laughs> I'm thinking, okay, love, Valentine's Day, Judy Call. And guess what she announced from the stage? Her father was a graduate of the University of Idaho. Class in 1937, so I'm thinking, okay, I can go here, but then this whole kind of <coughs> love's illusion seems sort of depressing for Valentine's Day. I didn't even know we were gonna have balloons. So I decided, <laughs> no, not Judy Collins. What else? Well, last week, Sir Paul McCartney, like of the Beatles, right? You know, those of you uh, will do a little kind of Talk about the Beatles later if you don't know who that is. The greatest rock and roll band ever. Released a new CD. And one of the tracks is called My Valentine. 
I'm thinking, okay, I can work with this. And then it turns out that John Clayton, the artistic director of the Lionel Hampton Jazz Festival, and Jeff Hamilton, often a guest here and <coughs> longtime member of the Lionel Hampton Advisory Board, Jazz Festival Advisory Board, did backup on this CD. And the Jazz Festival is next week, and you should all attend. It's kind of shameless promotion. And I'm thinking, okay, I can make something of that. And then I thought I could talk about how far it is, and I don't just mean chronologically, from I Want to Hold Your Hand to the title of this new CD, which is Kisses on the Bottom. <laughs> And I then figured that that was a road that I probably didn't want to go down either in this setting. So by this time, the pressure has only continued to mount. So Saturday, I'm watching basketball. My husband and I are seated in the very back. I stand up because I want to look at the whole court because in my opinion, Dealing with full court pressure was not one of the things the Vandals were doing that well, even though they won. And I thought perhaps I might be able to provide some, some assistance from the audience on that issue. So I'm, I'm surveying the court, and while I'm standing there, six people come up and say, boy, I'm looking forward to your talk about Valentine's Day. <laughs> and my husband is seated next to me. And at basketball, if you go, there's a jam -a meter where you keep track of jams and people get free yogurt. And my anxiety meter was, he clearly knew, going up and up. Joe Schwartz, some of you don't know him, is 6'4", 280 on a good day when the scale is cheating. And he looks at me and he says, well, the title says Cupid. I could put on a diaper <laughs> and carry a bow and arrow and come run through the room. <laughs> One of the ways you sustain a 38-year marriage is that you don't let your, your partner make a bad decision <laughs> that in the very least is embarrassing and may very well be illegal. In many states, there's a connection <laughs> to law. So I go, I have to focus. I have to have a topic here of which I can discuss. So I'm thinking, I am a, history of, a historian of women. Rodney told you that. I ought to know what I'm supposed to talk about. And so I finally got there. And you're going, she finally got there. The talk's almost <laughs> over. So I decided I would talk about Esther Allen Howard. When you look at her dates, you will see that it spans most of the 19th century. The 19th century is incredibly important for American history, which is what I do, and for women's history specifically, for a couple of reasons. And I'm looking at Ray Dacey. Partly it's a business connection. <laughs> there is a huge change in the nature of where productivity resides in not just American society and culture, but in European and Western society and culture in the 19th century. Before the 19th century, people's productivity, the, the work that they did, was associated with their households and where they lived. So if you're a farmer, you live on the farm. If you own a tavern, you probably live above the tavern. If you're a weaver, people who make cloth, you probably do that at home. If you own a newspaper, you live behind the newspaper. People's work and productivity was a family and household endeavor. Because of vast economic changes that Ray Dacey, Professor Dacey, could tell you about, that begins to change in the 19th century. And people begin to go to work a phrase which were for people in the, in the 17th and, and 18th century would have been meaningless. But think how, where's Rodney, ubiquitous that phrase is, I'm going to work. Where do you work? The idea that you would go to work is a new deal. But primarily the people who went to work were men. 
So men went to work. Conversely, women began to stay home. They began to stay home, and they were less productive in an economic sense, but nevertheless pivotally important to what happened in American society because they became the centers of consumption. So without women in households consuming, none of the consumer society that we talk about would exist. And so women came, became more and more associated with this sphere at home. Some historians talk about them being sort of imprisoned in that sphere. I prefer a different sort of approach to that. Women created in many ways their own sphere of influence in homes that one prominent historian, Nancy Cott, calls the cult of true womanhood. True women were pure. True women were pious. True women were domestic. And true women were submissive. And I got issues with a number of those, and we won't <laughs> say which one and in which order. But nonetheless, it was a sphere that women created for themselves and gave them power. Well, nothing is that simple in American history or any kind of history. And so at about the same time, women's colleges came into being in this country. There had been women's seminaries and other institutions of kind of post-secondary education, but they had um, studied topics like uh, flower arranging and music and uh, decorum and embroidery was big. Women's colleges in the 19th century prided themselves on having curriculum that was the same as men's colleges. The big debate was, could women's health and their sanity survive higher education? Which is a question I have asked myself on a number of occasions <laughs> in other settings as well. However, in the early part of the 19th century, the, 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 the notion was that mental activity took blood away from your nervous system and your reproductive system. If you're a woman, man, I don't know what happened to them. So w would, could this possibly work? And lo and behold, women seem to be able to go to college and not suffer any terrible consequences. Once they did that, though, it becomes a huge issue for them because they have this sphere at home that they've worked to establish as the base of their power, then you go to college and you learn all the many things that you all are enjoying that are so, then what do you do with all that knowledge if you don't have some place to go? And it becomes one of the big topics of conversation for elite women who are part of this first and second generation of college graduates and eventually they become new women, we call them. And Esther Allen Howard is an example of, of, of that. She was born in Worcester, Massachusetts, obviously in 1828. She's a graduate of Mount Holyoke, class of 1847. Mount Holyoke was founded in 1837. So you can tell, even with history math, that she was one of the early graduates of Mount Holyoke. Right? Her father was the most prominent paper and stationery merchant in Worcester. When she graduated from Mount Holyoke, one of his business associates gave her a fancy valentine from England. She looks at the valentine. Remember, her father owns a stationery store and thinks to herself, I could make valentines like that. And she, in fact, made 12 different Valentines. And her brother, who was the salesperson for this stationery store and business, agreed to take them around to his customers and see if anyone would buy them. Yeah? Esther hoped that he would get $200 worth of orders. He got $5,000 worth of orders and the first trip around New England. <coughs> Esther can't make that many Valentines herself, right? <laughs> so what does she do? She creates 
wait for it, Ray, an assembly line for Valentine production. <laughs> which has a science and technology piece as well. Here, here are women making valentines in Worcester, Massachusetts for Esther's business, yeah? It becomes so successful that by the time we get to the middle part of the 19th century, she's making $100,000 a year, right around three million bucks in today's money. Her valentines, Go, we know, we have examples of them, going all the way to San Francisco and all points in between. She is, by all accounts, solely responsible for making Valentine cards popular in the United States. She ran that business until the 1880s for most of that time from a wheelchair, which was also very unusual. She had knee problems that there were replacement knees in the 19th century, and that's what she did. So here are some <coughs> examples of some of her valentines. And you can see that one of the things that characterized her valentines, and talk about ubiquitous, how many times did you cut out the red heart and put it on that white doily? <laughs> Remember that? Well, one of the important changes in modern business and manufacturing at the time that Esther started making these valentines was the mass production of paper lace. Talk about ubiquitous, right? You can't imagine a valentine without paper lace. And if there weren't factories that made paper lace, what would poor Esther and her friends do? But they had paper lace, they could make these beautiful romantic valentines, and what do we say, the rest is history. So what does all this tell us? You know, that's kind of the historian's job, we get to tell the story and then we tell why it's important. Well, it's important on a number of levels. One of the things that characterizes the sub-discipline of women's history is that we have often found that subdiscipline really doesn't even get a start until the 1960s, which for some of you seems like a long time ago, but trust me, was not long ago, is that there are all kinds of women who had important roles that they played in American society and culture and economics. They aren't the roles that we traditionally think of women playing, and yet they have a huge sort of impact. And Esther Howland is an example of that. I mean, there would be no $17.6 billion worth of Valentine stuff if somebody hadn't started sending cards in the 19th century, and she's the one that did that. So that's one of the things this tells us. Secondly, this whole idea that she would use an assembly line to produce these Valentines is one of the areas of science and technology that people like me who are interested in the history of work and workers and how workers interact with their work is probably the most important dimension of change in terms of manufacturing in the 19th century. I mean, we usually date it from Eli Whitney at the very beginning of the 19th century, although other people had tried it, and it culminates with Henry Ford at the early part of the 20th century as the person who really makes the moving assembly line with interchangeable parts writ large. But here in the middle of that century is a woman who established a business based on that principle, successfully operated that principle on that principle during the 19th century, and that tells us much about the development of the assembly line and its role in making the American consumer culture what it is. Thirdly, as you could tell by the picture, these are women who are working to make these valentines in this assembly line. So guess what? They aren't at their house, right? They're somewhere else. And so even though we have this stereotypical view that women's place is in the home and that's where their sphere is, there are lots of examples of all kinds of women who engage in work 
on a number of levels, not just these white sort of middle class women in Massachusetts, but as you all know, <coughs> Africans, slaves during the early part of this, and other people of color and immigrants engaged in all kinds of domestic work, but also in a variety of kinds of factory work in low, for low pay and in much more terrible conditions than what you saw those dressed up women um, doing in, in, in Worcester, Massachusetts. And so the whole sort of story of this Valentine kind of sales is a really important part of what we think about women's history. I think I'm at number four now. We know that these Valentines were sold, as I said, as far west as San Francisco and really all across the country. So what that tells us about the development of um, transportation and communication networks in this country is a, a, a huge story that is critical to explain in how Northerners could win the Civil War, for example, and how American economy developed at the level that we talk about now. And related to that, one of the things that people like me who are interested in culture are particularly fascinated with and seems like no big deal to us in the year 2012, somebody in Massachusetts could purchase and send the same card with the same picture on it as somebody in Salt Lake City could send. What does that tell us about the nature of <coughs> consumer culture and of American society and the complex interconnections of peoples, not just in an <coughs> economic sense, but in terms of how they identify themselves and how they express something as sentimental as love? five or six or some other number. A valentine is not an essential commodity. You don't eat it. You don't drink it. It doesn't keep you warm. It doesn't keep the rain off your head. Nobody really needs a valentine. And yet, people bought valentines. And Esther sold a bunch of valentines. And by the time she sold her business, she sold it for about $100,000, which in purchasing power is pretty close to about three million bucks in our money at the time. So this is an incredibly successful business, selling something that no one really needs. Yeah? In some ways, that may be a metaphor for a number of things in the American consumer culture that keep our society and our economic system running. If you don't go, even though Yahoo says, men who buy flowers, it's really stupid of you and it shows you aren't imaginative. Deep down inside, we still like flowers, women do, and I think men do too, but they don't have a use. They do not fulfill some need that a person has to survive. So Esther is, is, is an example of, of, of that. She remained single her whole life. <coughs> One of the recurring themes of women's history in the 19th century is that women felt compelled to make a choice between whether or not they would inhabit this domestic sphere or they would choose this role of new woman, especially college-educated <coughs> women, and she's an example of, of that. Another example, um, Alice Freeman Palmer might be another example, a University of Michigan graduate. She was a high school principal by age 22, a professor of history, you can see why I chose her, um, at Wellesley by the time she was 24, president of Wellesley by the time she was 26, retired at age 33 to be married and raise a family because she couldn't do both <coughs> and exist in both places. And certainly this whole story of this businesswoman and her role in American society, there's an irony there because most of the people who are purchasing Valentines are sending them to a significant other but this is a woman who remained single all her life to run this business 
making the cards that other people could sing. So that's the story that I wanted to tell today about Valentine's. Happy Valentine's to all of you. And I'd be happy to engage in some conversation with you. And in fact, sometimes there's even more angst than I recounted to you, but I didn't think it was suitable for students who I'm hoping will engage in sort of intellectual work later on. <laughs> um, it is, I will tell you, one of the most, I, I, I worry as my people in my office, all my wonderful colleagues have seen me pacing around today. I, I get really nervous about what I might do. I am trained to sit in an archive, thinking about Dean Baird in a library and do research, not to talk in front of this many people. So the process makes me very anxious of preparing what to say and the actual delivery of it. I would rather walk across <coughs> glass. <laughs> yes, Tom. Hey, I think we have to make a comment. You said that flowers are not essential, but for me, it's a survival of today. Uh, so <laughs> Yeah, I made a poor choice. I was telling some colleagues earlier on, um, I was married on February 16th, which was very bad planning on my part because I only get the flowers one time instead of <laughs> two times. Well, yes? Do you think women are successfully balancing the spirit these days? Oh, I think that's a really good question. I mean, early on in the women's movement, my generation of feminists, the big mantra was that you could have it all. You could have a home and a family and a relationship and a career and do all those things. Well, we practically killed ourselves. And I think there now tends to be a kind of different attitude that we don't have to do all those things. We can do all of them pretty well and not all of them exceptionally well or it's okay to choose to be a stay-at-home mother instead of having a career, or it's okay to choose having a career instead of having a family. It's okay <laughs> to make some choices, which I think is a step in the right direction for, for, for women, but has been a, a painful step in the women's movement and has created some pretty considerable tension between my generation of women who are going, geez, we fought and fought and fought so that everybody could have it all and now they don't want it all? What's the matter with them? <laughs> um, and younger women are going, were you all out of your mind? And the answer is probably yes. And so <laughs> that's a really good question that is bigger than that answer was. Yeah. Was uh, Miss Bauer the first one to use Yes, she's the first person to use the assembly. She's the first person to make any greeting cards in this country, period, and especially to make them at that level. Um, and particularly, she emphasized Valentine's, and they literally worked the whole year to have enough Valentine's to meet the demand that continued to, 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 to grow for that. So she's, I mean, here's a name that probably, let's face it, maybe wasn't a household name. And yet, without her, this whole conversation we're engaging in today would be a non-conversation. So, yeah. Yeah. Do you suppose the reason that Elsie Post's staff was saying less women was so she could help other women to escape the domestic abuse by her? Hmm, that's a really interesting question. I'm not convinced that she wanted them to escape, but it would have been quite unseemly for her to engage in work <coughs> that involved the direct supervision of male workers, and so that was, was, was part of it. And I think she, my indication about her is that she was interested in providing an opportunity for women to do something outside of the sphere, but most women who engaged in this work, or even at Lowell, Massachusetts, in the very famous textile mills, did it for a certain period of time. Often they saved a little money, or they had an experience away from home, but then they returned to a more <coughs> traditional life later on. They didn't, like Esther did, make a career 
of business or their work. Middle class, white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant women we're talking about. Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, she. I, I wouldn't say she was active, but our best evidence is that she participated in in the suffrage movement. As one of the centers of that movement was New England in this in this period. And so, I, I saw Gary Williams come in. He knows a lot more about this than than I do. But that would make sense. <sighs> Professor Warren. Ah, well, I'm looking at Professor Dacey again. We don't have market research in the 19th <laughs> century um, where we're thinking about you know, who's buying what. But we know that women were consumers of a lot of this. And you, we took the picture down. But as you can see, they're kind of feminine in how they look. And so we're pretty sure that lots of women were buying these cards. But we also know that men were buying these cards to give to women. So that's a way of saying, I don't know, Mark. <laughs> and in reality, most middle class women didn't have their own money. So in reality, regardless of who put down the money, it's middle class men who are responsible for the purchases. Yeah. Were women giving to other women because of that whole romantic friendship that happened? <sighs> or were they giving them for male partners? Yeah, one of the. Um, Best known articles about this period is called The Female World of Love and Ritual, where it talks about the nature of female friendships in the early part of the 19th century. Um, some of these are sort of homoerotic relationships. Some of them are just friendships. We are, they, they write these endless letters back and forth. They clearly have, especially in New England, this community of women with relationships that are probably different than what we're accustomed to. There does tend to be pretty good evidence that a lot of those friendships began at women's colleges, such as Wellesley and Mount Holyoke and Vassar. And so that may certainly be part of who is giving these Valentines back and forth to one another. Although, as I said, Helen got her first Valentine from a business acquaintance of her father. So like today, there's a difference between really close relation and like, uh, you all got a valentine from me, but I'm not sure that I have an intimate relationship with <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Jeffrey, I wonder what was inside the card. I, I oh. spent an awful lot of time thinking about what was inside the card. And it seemed like you had a lot of Right. And these are great because they're blank inside. <laughs> and because this is a day when people actually like wrote their own, <laughs> which is a good thing. I'm looking at Professor Nakotra in the back. No, we, we, we applaud writing. We applaud people being able to express their sentiments in prose, not relying on, yes. So yes, they're blank inside. So you get to send your own message. Pardon? When did they start putting messages? Not until later in the 20th century. When, because we didn't have time to write our own message, and then you all know the story. But so that you have to do it, so you got to find the message that, well, is ubiquitous, whereas, or <laughs> at least doesn't embarrass you when you're sending it to somebody, which is no small feat, it seems to me, in a lot of cases. Who's over? Yeah. So she spent her life building up this wonderful business, and she sold it. Did she sell it to another woman? Nope, she sold it to a man. Um, Howland Valentine, I don't know what the name of it, but the, it would have been a rare woman who had a hundred thousand dollars to buy a business in 1888. Yeah. Um, how much did the cards cost? Uh, they varied, but they started in the penny range. So you can imagine, I can't. I was I was started to do the math, and <coughs> Debbie Stores, the associate dean, wasn't there to help me about how many. Valentine's at a penny it took to get a, I couldn't even go there, but you got to make a heck of a lot of Valentine's to get $100,000. That's all, all I know. And sell them to lots of people. Thanks. You've been terrific. I appreciate it. <laughs>